Well, good afternoon. This is Dan Bell. It is Friday, September 20th. Um, I am here with Robin Gare. A little bit of background. Um, we're working today uh, on behalf of Future of Hampton Roads. That's www.fhrinc.org. Uh, I am the president of Future of Hampton Roads. Robin is the chair of our transportation committee, regional transportation committee. Robin also serves on Hampton Roads for Rail and Virginians for High Speed Rail. The topic of today's interview is High Speed Rail. And, uh, and the good news is that um, that uh, Hampton Roads is is quickly making up for lost ground where several years ago we weren't uh, being considered for for high-speed rail uh, as a result of uh, of efforts from our recently departed uh, chairman Ray Taylor uh, efforts uh, from people like Robin Gayer we are making up ground fast the uh, the further good news is that we have relaunched train service out of Norfolk which hasn't been in in place for for 30 years um, and, uh, and we are looking at plans to include uh, Hampton Roads in a higher speed rail uh, connection which eventually, and we'll talk about that, Robin will talk more about that, uh, allow us to, to get to Washington DC in perhaps three hours. And, uh, and so that's our goal. Um, there's several organizations within the region that are, are uh, um, leveraging their strengths to, uh, to work this effort. Um, and Robin is at the point of that. So with that, I will introduce you to, uh, uh, to Robin and, uh, and ask him to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about higher speed rail and, and then we'll talk about some questions and answers along the way that uh, will help to clarify the topic. So Robin, welcome. Hey, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for pulling this together. This is obviously uh, one of the most important topics that our region has faced and will face in the next 50 years. Uh, I can't think of one thing economically that could have as drastic of a positive effect on our region and our regional economy uh, than successfully achieving our vision of higher speed rail in Hampton Roads. Well, very good. And, and uh, perhaps you can uh, explain some of those, those financial incentive opportunities. Incentives probably isn't the right word, but advantages. And we've, we've heard about transportation in our, our region. We've heard about the uh, congestion on the roads. Uh, the deterioration of the roads, the, uh, the traffic, um, you know, all of these elements. How can higher speed rail or passenger rail, in addition to light rail, which is a whole different topic, but how can passenger rail help us in that situation? That, that's a terrific question and a great launching point. Uh, what we have now is a newly established service of passenger rail between Norfolk, Richmond, and D.C. Uh, that trip currently takes a little bit over four and a half hours. So it is not quite competitive with driving an automobile. Most of the time you can drive in less than four and a half hours to DC. Sometimes you're gonna get hit in some really rough rush hour traffic and it's gonna take six or seven hours. We've all done that, no one enjoys that. Uh, anytime you're on a train, you also benefit from being able to work while you're on the train. You can make phone calls, text message, work on a laptop, uh, lay back and enjoy a nap. So there's, it's actually a much better experience than driving in the car. Uh, and we get that benefit with either passenger rail as today and higher speed rail. Now, to talk about uh, the economics of the future, let me lay uh, some groundwork stories down. Uh, you mentioned maybe one day we could do a three hour trip to DC. Uh, that would be um, a very good goal, uh, but I wouldn't say that that is uh, the, the possible um, best case scenario. There are situations where we could create an opportunity to make a sub two hour trip mm. to DC. That would be great. And uh, if, if you can accomplish getting folks from downtown Norfolk with one stop, maybe in Bowers Hill or in Richmond, depending on which train you're on, into Union Station in under two hours, I would say there's no other way in the world to move people that fast. Uh, you can't put them even go into a private airstrip, get them on a private plane, land and shuttle them into DC. Uh, that quickly, and obviously cars can't compete with that, uh, nor can traditional uh, planes. Maybe uh, if you had a helicopter parked on the roof of a building <laughs> and you had a roof of a building to land in D.C., maybe a helicopter could get you there. So you raise a good point, Robin, and, uh, and it's all related, which hopefully you can speak to this too, it's all related to uh, the, the rails, the route, the, uh, the number of stations, the, and the speed uh, at which the train runs. And we've 
We've all had, uh, we, well, several of us have seen the definitions of high-speed rail around the world. I, I personally have, have ridden on high-speed rail in Europe, and, uh, and it's amazing. I mean, when you're talking about a, uh, approaching speeds of 200 miles an hour, it's, it's incredible. But we're not talking about that between Hampton Roads and DC as an example. We're talking about higher speed rail, and there's, there's issues associated with, uh, with tracks and routes and, and stations, and there's a couple different approaches that I think have been uh, discussed, and perhaps you can elaborate on those. Yeah, Europe is a great model if you have an extremely dense population. Japan would be another good example of uh, a very tight urban density along the corridor. We actually have a reasonably high uh, density population along our corridor. People don't really always understand that. With almost 2 million folks in Hampton Roads, 1.7 million, the population in Richmond and the Northern Virginia population, you can add up 10 million people that are along the crescent between here and Union Station. Keep it in mind that when you get to Union Station, you can take points further north with ease. Single seat service to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, those all come uh, tangentially from getting to Union Station. But we're going to just focus on our little J-hook corridor south of DC because that's what we're working on. That's a 10 million person corridor. That means to make the numbers work, to get a couple million riders per year, we only need two, three or four out of 10,000 people to be riding a train on any given day to come up with several million rides a year. Right now, with our rail service we have currently, we're looking at doing maybe 180,000 rides a year, maybe 200,000 rides a year. And so there's a way to get a tenfold uh, factor of how many people will take the train between here and DC. You so, know, so ridership is really important. Ridership's key. It's the key, right? And uh, we have had di uh, discussion along the way um, about the Northeast Corridor, the Southeast Corridor, where Hampton Roads lies in terms of, of which corridor we're on. Um, obviously, the, the, the strength of ridership is Hampton Roads North. I think we, and North, we're, we're currently in the Southeast Corridor, but ultimately those are all going to be connected, are they not? Yeah, eventually uh, Raleigh will punch through and connect in. Uh, we are the northernmost terminus of the Southeast. Uh, high-speed rail corridor. We really fit better into the northeast corridor as far as what our trade has been over the last several hundred years. Uh, nine out of ten or more people will ride north versus south, uh, but that's really semantics. Uh, they will get connected. Projects that need to get done will get done in time. Money that may not be available today will be available at some point, and I think that's, that's an important thing to realize. Uh, what makes this type of infrastructure possible, I think, go, as our society looks at it going forward, will be, is it sustainable? Can it stand on its own two legs and pay for itself? Now, there's not a lot of transportation in the world that can pay for itself. A stop sign doesn't pay for itself. A piece of interstate doesn't pay for itself, except through backwards mechanisms like gas tax and an officer writing a speeding ticket if you run a stop sign. There are ways to recoup money from that, but they're not direct. They're not user fee related. With rail, you have the advantage of charging someone a ticket. With the way we have our passenger rail lines set up today, the prices that we can extract for people to take them to DC in four hours and 40 minutes or so, uh, you can't charge a lot of money for that. You can charge about 38 or $40 for a round trip mm -hmm. for something like that. Mm -hmm. If you can get folks there faster than a car, mm -hmm. faster than a plane, now people will be willing to pay up for that service. Just like how 10 years ago we all had flip phones in our pocket and then Steve Jobs came along with the, with the iPhone. Well, we, we see that people are willing to shell out a whole lot of money if they get something that they can tangibly receive the value back in return. And if you tell me that there's not tangible value in being able to get to Union Station in a couple hours, people will pay for that. Absolutely service. right. Now, now uh, there's a term used, um, I believe it's fare box recovery, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the opportunity for some of the highest fare box recovery numbers out there are with our connectivity up north. Yes, uh, speaking fare box recovery, right now in 2013, prior to October, we are close to break even on our train operationally maybe a little bit over, maybe a little bit under. It'll take about a year to realize whether we're breaking even on our passenger rail service. After October, we're gonna have additional expenses that are gonna have to be bore by the state of Virginia that will be currently picked up uh, by the federal government and Amtrak. Mm 
-hmm. And so as that takes place, we will no longer be in the black. Mm -hmm. And as Norfolk Southern eventually charges a user fee for their track, which mm -hmm. is all fair, mm -hmm. uh, we will be further in the red. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding and from uh, the, the economists who have put work into studying this route, uh, we will bleed in perpetuity at our existing speed. No matter how many trains you put out there, we can't make it up in volume if we're losing money on every ticket. So in other words, the speed has to be higher to achieve the revenue and profitability necessary to make this an affordable in the black proposition. Yeah, it, it, if you were to draw it on a chalkboard, it would look like a parabola. Mm -hmm. And as the speed goes up, so does the amount of money uh, that folks will pay for it. And as it gets faster and faster, meaning a shorter and shorter trip time at the end of the day, it goes up exponentially. The break even, the, the best calculations I've seen were done, is somewhere between 105 and 110 miles an hour max speed is where you really hit the sweet spot where the thing can pay for itself. You, you go. go up north of there, 125, 150, if you were to do a green field and blaze a new track, uh, now you would be into something that would be solidly profitable, and solidly profitable from a standpoint that if we could get a fraction of the payment for the cost to build, maybe 35% or 45% from the government to build it, well, a company could come in, pay the rest, and make a full market return on their investment for every dollar they put into building it and operating. So the important, the, the important takeaway here is, as happy as we are that passenger rail service has started again out of Norfolk, this is the beginning to an end game that gets us to that 110 plus mile an hour convenience route between here and DC. I like to think of the Norfolk route as a starter service. Uh, whenever we first got the tide, we looked at the tide as a starter service. But I think everyone has a, a picture that's a little bit bigger vision than that, uh, including our, our state officials and the different folks that are behind the scenes working on this as well. Uh, we have a tier one EIS that has been accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a record of decision on that. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation has been working hard behind mm -hmm. the scenes to advance our efforts for mm -hmm. higher speed rail. Mm -hmm. And uh, we applaud that and uh, only encourage that process to continue to move quickly ahead mm -hmm. and do the tier two. And that's Thelma Drake and her, and her office, correct? That's correct. And, we, and as Robin points out, we're very thankful for their efforts today. Now, you talked about two different approaches, and, and uh, back in the early days of, of, of discussing this, and we're talking a couple of years ago, there was uh, plans of a red line and a, and, and a blue line, right? And I think that has evolved now, but basically you're talking existing versus greenfield. And, and perhaps you can talk about that a bit. Uh, yes, that's mostly correct. Let's talk about the existing so far. Because the existing isn't really the existing. It, it uses a lot of the existing infrastructure, but it lops off a section right out of Norfolk that goes down through the yard and down mm -hmm. through the swamp. Mm -hmm. There's a diagonal that can be cut on mm -hmm. Greenfield mm -hmm. through there that uh, the right of way easily attainable uh, and can shave off time. See, when you get to a swamp, it's hard to do upgrades because mm -hmm. there's environmental impacts sure. and so forth that you're not allowed to build anything new in a swamp. Right. And so having that ability to have a little stretch of land between here and Bowers Hill, Suffolk, uh, that really gives us an advantage on the existing route. So what we would do is we would put a new section of track between Norfolk and the Bowers Hill area and then piggyback on the Norfolk Southern CSX track yep. to get to Petersburg. Yep. And of course, of course, with our uh, our rail companies, you pointed this out earlier. It's it's got to be a win-win uh, for everybody. It's got to be a win for the the passengers. It's got to be a uh, a win for the for the uh, the railroads in terms of uh, utilization of their lines. Now, there was a term that Ray Taylor used to talk to us about: um, uh, freight deconfliction. Give us a definition on that. Yeah, uh, freight deconfliction is so important, and, and like you said. Our Class 1 railroads in Virginia are very powerful constituents of Virginia. Uh, they're very successful companies. Uh, I happen to be a capitalist. I happen to believe in American successful companies. Uh, if they say they don't want to do something with their property, I'm in agreement with that. Mm -hmm. It's their property. Mm -hmm. Now, to create a win-win is like what we did to achieve passenger rail. There are certain things that the freight railroads like to have, mm -hmm. uh, passing sidings, additional uh, signaling to make their tracks safer so that they can move their goods uh, and services easier themselves. So there are ways that in order to build in passenger rail capacity 
into their stream, uh, we can do things that are favorable to both passenger rail and freight rail simultaneously. A couple of those, for example, would be additional passing sidings. If you have two tracks running right next to each other, you can only run so many trains on them in any given amount of time. If you put sections of a third track next to it, now trains can do crossovers and go on a third section of track to pass a train, for example. And so it takes the capacity way up if you start adding things like crossovers. Uh, eventually you could build an entire third line right next to it, which would take capacity up that much more. Um, at the end of the day, though, it has to be what's in the best interest of a Norfolk Southern or a CSX mm -hmm. for them to allow us to operate in what we'd like to do. So we need to continue to become better partners with them, find opportunities where we can help them. Uh, there's something called um, positive train control. That's right, I recall that term. Positive train control is something that the class one railroads are having to put in, their, their timetable is 2015. Yeah. They'll probably push past that. Uh, what it is, is it's a modern day way of knowing where trains are at any given time. It uses satellites, it uses modern technology. Right. It's not just a guy looking down the track and saying, hey, right. there's a train coming. Right. With that positive train control, you can increase capacity because you can run trains closer to one another mm -hmm. and uh, you can do it safely. The federal government has said you have to do this. It's very expensive, mm -hmm. so maybe there's ways that we could trade off that would benefit passenger rail and freight rail by the state helping uh, them achieve their positive train control. Excellent point. And then extending that thought in terms of the improvements necessary, there's and, and you know we're talking about well there's a new station coming to Norfolk and that's that's outstanding news. In line with that, when we talk about uh, the improvements to the existing system to support this type of, of, uh, of train, we're talking about crossings, we're talking about stations, we're talking, a, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of infrastructure, which is where the money is going. I mean, it's not just rails, it's not just the trains, it's the, it's the infrastructure that supports those things. Is that correct? No, that is correct. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of... Uh, externalities and tangentials mm -hmm. that go along with it. Do you have someone inside a train station to sell tickets? Mm -hmm. Do you do it electronically mm -hmm. through a kiosk? Mm -hmm. All of these things have to be weighed and cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. done to see if it makes sense because mm -hmm. as I said before, in this day and age, if it can't stand on its own, people, aren't, they don't have the, their appetite to put mm -hmm. it out there, even though, and this, this is a very important point, whenever you have any type of transportation infrastructure, what you're really doing is you're really strengthening how much economy can happen in any given region. Mm -hmm. And so even if you don't get back 100 cents on a dollar on something, and I'm not saying that that's the right way to go, we put roads down for a reason. If we didn't have roads connecting cities, we wouldn't have cities mm -hmm. the way that they're capable of being done today in the business that can happen between city to city. So whenever you give folks an additional mechanism to travel between you know, the capital of the United States and uh, Pentagon South, which uh, Hampton Roads has been known as, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to allow people to do business more efficiently. And so it's not all on how much money you can take out of the fare box, it's how much do home prices go up near those train stations, right. what companies move right. to a region so they could be an offshoot community of DC. Right, right. You know, it, it, uh, and you and I have chatted about this on several occasions, it's, uh, it's really important for our listeners to realize that when we're talking about this improvement to our rail service, this is a national effort. It's a, it, it certainly will be a state effort and a regional effort, but this is not something that we're going to see in the next two years, five years. It's not even something you're going to see in 10 years. We're talking about a 20 to 30 year program to get to the point that we're actually seeing that sub three hour um, ride to, to DC and ideally two hours. It, and so it's 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 not for the faint of heart. It's for the uh, the the younger people, the next generation, to pick up this message and 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 realize that it's going to benefit them as much as it is people today. So that we need that help. Now, uh, we we have to close out now. It's it's um, we're approaching uh, the the twenty minute mark, and it's been a great conversation. But w what would you leave our listeners with? What what is the call to action? What can they do uh, to work with so many organizations and people are already engaged to help us advance this, um, this project for our region? Well, Dan, thank you again for caring so much about this issue. I know that you've worked tirelessly behind the scenes on this and in, on the scenes. Um, 
I would say number one, we have to have vision. We have to be able to look over the horizon and see what's staring us in the face on the other side. And if we have great vision, we can have great transportation. And if we have great transportation, we truly will have a great society here. And so the payoff is huge. So we've got to get this one right. So what can folks do? Well, uh, the first thing they can do is they can become informed. Education is key. If you don't understand uh, what high-speed rail is, how it pays for itself, how it builds economy for a region, I would encourage you to read and study this issue as much as you possibly can. Uh, become an informed citizen, an aware citizen, um, and just in general, learn about the topic. Second to that, there are always steps that are being taken place. I, I, I think of this effort we're doing for high-speed rail as a double marathon. It's, it's not a quick sprint, it's a double marathon because like you said, to have a viable project would take probably 20 years on the short end. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that are done over the next six months or a year uh, where we're going to be helping to educate people and bring them up to speed so that as other documents are released from the state and from consultants, we can have the working knowledge to line right up to where that, that knowledge base is whenever it's published so that we can make comments on it and we can constructively help uh, the stakeholders build a better system. So uh, there will be a number of opportunities to become informed over the next year, and then there are always times where um, flashes happen, where something needs to take place immediately, whether it's calling a legislator and helping to push something over the edge, or uh, making a public comment on something that we, we weren't really had too much time in advance to plan for. So there always are action items that pop up. Um, I'm going to just say finally that you know I truly believe that this is probably one of the two or three best uh, areas to build high-speed rail, true high-speed rail, in our nation. There's a whole lot of areas that have been given money and have high-speed rail dreams. Many of those will never work out. We need to have the stomach to know that our investment is a solid investment here. Political leaders need to know that they can take this on their shoulders and run with it and build an entire future for themselves out of this instead of just shying away from it and saying, ah, you know what, we're not into that. So thank you once again for shedding any light you have on this, and I look forward to continuing to help. Well, thank you, Robin. I don't think you could have articulated the, the region's position for, uh, for and on high-speed rail or higher-speed rail any better. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a great opportunity for us all, and I want to thank you again for your energy and your efforts. And, uh, and with that, uh, again, thank you to Robin Geyer, uh, from Future of Hampton Roads, Virginians for High Speed Rail and, and uh, Hampton Roads for Rail. And, uh, and this is Dan Bell from Future of Hampton Roads. And as, uh, as we have updates on, the, on the, our higher speed rail project along the way, we will provide these updates. Remember, all this, all this detail and more can be found at www.fhrinc.org, Regional Transportation. And thank you again for your support of higher speed rail. And also, we want to mention, different topic, keep voting for light rail. <laughs> Absolutely. All we right. can hear it digging in the background. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you.